Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks, and today we have the ENFJ Live Q&A. And so Emerus, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Certainly. <laughs> Specifically the cognitive functions, I assume, or just me in general? Uh, a brief overview of you, your elevator pitch of who you are. Ah, okay. Well, I can't be contained to an elevator, so. <laughs> I am Emerus. I teach and tutor as a job. I am fascinated by philosophy and spirituality and different perspectives on existence. Uh, my passions for life are generally in the areas of teaching and um, various kinds of what you might call uh, counseling or providing support non-professionally right now, hopefully professionally in the future. And generally like in encouraging and listening to people and inspiration and strength to move along their chosen path. That's beautiful. And for, well, thank you. <laughs> um, more mundanely for hobbies, I really enjoy uh, reading and learning in general. I really enjoy D&D &D, and I really enjoy uh, staying up till 3 a.m. having lovely conversations with people. Mm, mm, those are one of my favorite pastimes too. And so Emerus, would you like to tell us a bit about extroverted feeling, Effie? Sure. For me, extroverted feeling manifests as an almost constant awareness of other people's emotions and of the social webs in which we live and how actions within a social system affect each person within the social system. Uh, it's sort of instinctual for me where I'm just, thoughts will just arise into my mind about how saying something one way will affect someone differently than saying it another way. Uh, I will very frequently feel a sort of simulacrum or echo of another person's emotions within myself when they're experiencing it. Or even if I am not uh, echoing it emotionally, I often have an immediate intuitive understanding of what it would be like to be experiencing what that other person is experiencing. And it becomes easy to essentially imagine myself as that other person living their life. And it, I, tend to be very sensitive to how people respond uh, verbally and non-verbally to different emotional statements, if that makes sense. Any kind of emotionally charged statement, when I use it or see other people use it, I immediately pick up on how other people are reacting to it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so how do you experience NI, introverted intuition? My favorite one. Um, I primarily would say I experience NI as finding it easy to just sense when I really resonate or vibe with something. Uh, it seems like my mind is often doing a lot of unconscious processing. And then when I'm presented with a particular perspective on reality or idea that really um, fits in with the internal web of my perception of reality, uh, it immediately clicks. And I can't always explain why. Um, it also makes it very easy for me to put myself in other people's perspectives and sort of not in the necessarily immediate emotional feeling way of FE, but in the sort of uh, logical um, building a little uh, inner structure of what it would be like to be this other person and to understand how their ideas are connected to other ideas. And that's the main um, underlying theme is connection of ideas, seeing how uh, every possible perspective on reality is part of a massive web that's almost like standing within a sphere and whichever direction you look within a sphere or whatever portion of your perception you cover up, you can see uh, different worldviews or perspectives on reality. Mm. That is wild and awesome. And I'd love to go into that with you during the interview. So if you have any questions about Emerus that you want to ask, feel free to ask it in the live Q&A chat. And so how do you experience extroverted sensing, Essie? Hmm. I think that personality hackers model of it being like a young child is very accurate in the sense that I don't have a strong desire to um, achieve or compete in extroverted sensing areas in the sense of like sports or athletics or any, any kind of physical involvement with the world in that way. Um, but I have a very strong desire to play 
in the physical world, essentially. So any kind of athletic activity, um, any kind of sensory activity tends to be primarily uh, sort of rejoicingly, laughingly celebratory interaction with reality. And for, I think for that reason, I tend to see the magic of reality through um, physical beauty, like beauty of nature, beauty of uh, design or of certain locations. Um, and those things seem sort of charged with magic for me in a very childlike way, but also in a way that feels like that space that sort of artists connect to when they feel like they're touching the infinite or channeling something from deep within themselves. And that's kind of what it feels like when I look at the beauty of the world. Mm, that is gorgeous. And so what's your experience of introverted thinking, T.I.? Mm. Um, I think it's possible that I've developed introverted thinking a lot more than I ever intended to or ever thought of. Um, I spent a lot of my life attempting to build a logical map of reality to understand like metaphysical and existential questions. And so I spent a lot of time tweaking internal logic maps and then trying to figure out how they all fit together with each new piece of data. And that's kind of a big part of my interests and how I tend to communicate. Like I tend to, that's a lot of my teaching style or focus, like showing this sort of massive complicated map of how all these different things are logically connected. And um, it's also something that I've had challenges with because it's impossible to completely map reality. And when you attempt to gain a sense of security or understanding of life through logical systems, they always come up short. And so I've had to move actually more into not using NI, but trusting NI in that, um, in realizing that basically I could never know everything about reality. So the fact that there are uh, certain perspectives on reality or certain experiences of reality that bring me genuine joy and help me love other people better and that kind of thing, um, that it's okay to trust those without being able to know with 100% apodictic certainty that all my perceptions of reality are correct. But TI definitely presents a challenge with that because it's a habit to want to explain everything. Mm, well put, well put, Emerus. Cool. And so the first question the audience has for you is Ron asks, how do you experience SI? Okay. Is the pair significant here? The word? No, polar. So it means oh, point polar. Of least resistance, AKA, how do you fumble in the dark with SI? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, for one, my memory is rather terrible for actual events. I'm very good at remembering ideas, very bad at, like, I've told uh, friends before that everything before about maybe freshman to sophomore year of, university feels like somebody else was living my life or feels like a dream or something. Um, I also have a very strong aversion to anytime tradition is used as a persuasive element because my uh, sort of negative reaction is to immediately assume it's an attempt to control or attempt to um, use fear or um, you aren't allowed to go outside the bounds. And so I tend to I would say in some ways overreact to an argument from tradition or an argument from past experience, partly because um, NI immediately is like, well, that's just your experience. How in the world would I know that your experience is valid for anyone but you? Um, and I also have a tendency to want to uh, transgress expected traditions or even expected social structures where um, even in my humor, like somebody doing something ridiculous that um, kind of pokes fun at normal social structures immediately will get me laughing. And um, I have a tendency to want to be like, how, how would I put it? Like a trickster with 
messing with tradition. And I have to reel that back in sometimes because there's a tendency to want to be like, hmm, well, let me like ask a slightly ridiculous question that will poke at poke holes in your worldview and make you, like force you to think about tradition. But I don't think that's always helpful to people's like life journeys. So yeah, I would say I have a sort of arrogance when it comes to SI. Mm. I tend to ask myself when people give me advice, is that wisdom or is that projection? Are they mm. just projecting onto me something they've gone through? And so it's interesting how you called it trickster because SI is actually in the trickster spot for ENFJs. Mm. How often do you go out? It depends on the week. I tend to actually oscillate between like going out every night or like 80% of the nights of the week to like spending the whole evening indoors. Uh, it really depends on like my emotional state and how stable I am at managing my schedule that week. Ideally, I would love to go out like almost every night. Mm, wow. Because even if I'm just wanting to chill, like going out and doing that somewhere, like going to a bar with friends and just relaxing there, even if it's super noisy, feels very relaxing to me. Mm, what about it is relaxing? Uh, so the social energy of it, and it makes me feel like I'm living life, essentially, <laughs> like I'm experiencing things as opposed to um, experiencing only the familiar environment of my home. Mm, true say. And so which function do you feel like you're better at, NI or SE? Definitely NI. Uh, mm -hmm. SE, I'm very able to be playful with it and rejoice with it and be almost giddy about all the different aspects of it, but I'm not particularly skilled with it. I tend to be somewhat clumsy. I tend to like uh, take a long time to learn new physical things, possibly because of overanalyzing them. Uh, and NI is like where I live. Mm, yeah, that's where a lot of your spiritual philosophies have been stemming up from too. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about selfishness? I believe that selfishness is largely misunderstood or misconstrued by our culture. So there's a perception in our culture that the best thing you can do for the world is to either balance all the social commitments that you have or social obligations that you have to sort of fit into the social structure and be responsible or to set aside um, your desires and comforts and all that in order to try to be of service to other people, which has its place, uh, but it's often done at the expense of ignoring the manner in which you actually want to live and the manner in which you actually want to serve. And the, in my opinion, the way that you'll be most effective both at finding joy in life and at helping other people and helping the world uh, and at remaining stable over the long term is getting to know what you most deeply desire. And we often will think of that as selfish, like, oh, you're just following your desires. But it's actually something very um, morally demanding in that if you dig down deep enough into what you most deeply desire, you won't find like, for most people, you won't find like, oh, I just want a nice car or a comfortable house or something. You'll find that you have some kind of desire to do something that would demand quite a lot of you that would in all likelihood help a lot of other people as well and that would challenge you to grow in countless ways and to direct your whole life to figuring that out and then pursuing that wholeheartedly it's almost like a, a boot camp style mentality where you have no right but to do other than your deepest truest will mm. So everyone in the live chat, feel free to ask questions that are not related to typology too. So this is a really good question because I think either indirectly we'll be learning about ENFJs, even if it's like Emerus's style of ENFJ through those questions more. And so with selfishness, it is quite, um, it's, it can be quite harmful too if people view selfishness completely negatively too because there's a part of it that's necessary because people become selfish when they don't want to become selfish because they've been neglecting themselves so much. Your body will gravitate towards being selfish if 
you don't address it for long enough. So it's almost like if you're not looking out for future you enough, your psych will eventually feel resentful at you. And then you will then do selfish things without wanting to be selfish. So it's good to kind of be cognizant of your own needs because if your needs aren't met, it's easy to turn into a monster without knowing it. And it's worse to be a monster than it is to take care of yourself. So mm -hmm. that would be my take on it. Will people with the ENFJ personality type be less successful in the world of sports? I'm a footballer, but don't feel very competitive. I would say no, uh, primarily because it's not only like an extreme talent for physical athletics that makes you successful in that world. Um, for one, if you're really wanting to go into the professional world, the ability to navigate social situations and to sort of um, cultivate a good relationship with the, your superiors and your team and the people around you is extremely important, especially for a team sport. And a lot of, we tend to think of um, high level athletics or high level artistry as something primarily due to talent. Like we talk about like, oh, this person is so lucky to be so good at this. And in reality, if you practice enough, um, there are certain limitations, but and, you know, you could it could be that you never get to an Olympic level because you didn't have like as much innate talent as the Olympian did. But that that level of innate talent isn't necessarily required to even play professionally. Mm, interesting. And how do SE help you to interact with other people? <laughs> um, it makes it very easy to sort of vibe with the social scene whether it's like partying or dancing or going to a sports event like people tend to express their social interaction through physical activities so i can get on board with those and at least um like sort of line up my own emotional vibration with the excitement of the people around me even if i wouldn't inherently have the same level of excitement as they do like i sort of uh get amped up because they're amped up about it uh, similarly, it also helps for a lot of the playful aspects of social interaction because those are mediated through the body. And so it's easy for me to, um, to be flirtatious, to be playful and silly, to uh, not necessarily take myself too seriously, and to be like, to have a little touch of ridiculousness that helps a lot with social interaction. Well, you sound like a good time. So it's almost <laughs> like FESC is able to get you playful in the proximity of playful people. It amplifies that and you can kind of also feel the vibe of the yeah. room and follow. And I would also say I tend to seek out that to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so what function would you likely think wants to understand more? Sorry, <laughs> I, I read this too quick. What, what function would you most likely want to understand more that's not in your slot or not? <laughs> Well, I'll go with my initial intuition, which is FI. Um, it's very difficult for me to discern what my uh, deepest desires and most authentic self are. I tend to have um, many, many different uh, aspects of myself spread out across different aspects of my life. And so it's difficult to bring all that together into a... Uh, singular sense of identity that gives me a sense of direction of like this is what I most value in life or this is what it looks like to be most authentically me and it's also I don't have an innate sense of when I'm doing that um, I've had to take a roundabout route with meditation techniques that basically uh, help you allow the thinking mind to wind down and move into silence so that you can just act without thinking. And that tends to produce a more authentic manifestation of yourself. But it's my perception that people with very strong FI tend to have a much stronger sense of who they are and what it feels like to be authentic to themselves. And I would like to know what that feels like to constantly know that. And why, because I feel like most of my struggles in life have been about um, not knowing exactly who I am or what I, exactly what I want, um, or at least not being able to narrow that down. And I'm just like, what uh, difficulties and what joys does it bring to know that constantly? Mm, makes sense. 
And so Jack asks, do you think that having FE in the second or third slot is very different than FE first? IFJs seem to be able to turn their FE on and off. Is FE more automatic, automatic to you? Can you easily turn it off? I can't easily turn it off to the point where um, I've had to learn what a lot of like people in the new age woo communities would call like shield empath shielding, which is depending on what you believe it is, could be anything from just psychological tactics to like actual interaction with metaphysical worlds or something. But basically I've had to learn to draw boundaries in the emotional space between myself and other people. Um, because oftentimes someone can walk into the same building that I'm in and suddenly my entire like mood and feeling changes. And I don't know why until I'm like, Oh wait, somebody else walked in and I somehow picked up on what they were feeling. Um, as far as INFJ to ENFJ, one of the things I've noticed is that comparing myself to my INFJ friends, I don't disconnect from the social web almost ever. I'm just sort of automatically interacting with it and thinking about it and drawn into it. Like, even if I want to disconnect from it, I have to be very, very intentional about it. And then as far as, you know, I could be like retreating into contemplation or meditation or something. And even then a lot of the distractions will be connected to the social web. So it's just like being constantly plugged into it. Mm. Wow. With empath shielding, what has helped the most? Mm. On the level of like philosophy about it, the idea that you essentially get to decide um, what your emotional experience of the world is, or more accurately, what your response to your emotional experience of the world is, which then gradually changes your emotional experience of it. You actually can decide what to do with emotions when they arise in your mind, how to uh, think of them and how to respond to them. And uh, the validity of you as a autonomous being, like it is completely legitimate for you to construct the, let's say the universe around you that you wish to experience and that nobody can um, violate that unless you either implicitly or explicitly give them permission to, which isn't always easy, right? Because we often have conditioned patterns of giving people permission to override our uh, right to determine how we experience reality. And it takes practice to like not do that all the time. But um, I often struggled with like unworthiness and feeling like I, it wasn't valid for me to um, be autonomous or to decide what I wanted. Um, and then for the actual shielding, um, there are like, rituals within the Western esoteric tradition that are more extensive on it. But one of the most simple ones that I, I've come across is like, um, imagine a barrier around yourself in the emotional space, maybe about three feet out from your body, which is classic for like aura thinking. Um, that's like, as like a razor sharp bubble around you that keeps anything you don't want to let into your emotional system out where you, but you can still observe it. And to some extent, feel it without absorbing it into yourself. Um, and then I've also noticed that um, bringing your, uh, I, th I think you, again, you could argue whether this is like metaphysical or just psychological, but bringing your wrists or hands or ankles together um, sees, seems to like close you off emotionally. So like I had a friend teach me to do this, I wanted you to do that. And almost like you're imagining whatever you're feeling coming at you spreading around you instead of like hitting you. And it seems to work really well. Like I've frequently been in conversation with people where I feel like their emotional state is starting to overwhelm me. And I'll just do that and like sit with my hands like that. And it feels like instead it flows around me and I'm still able to observe and understand it. Um, similarly, you can also just like bring your hands together and your ankles together and that will kind of give you a sense of like stability and like being a uh, closed off autonomous system who gets to decide what comes into that system. Mm, yeah, there's an element of release you can kind of get out of that visualization and being able to let go of the motions, even if it's a picture in your mind. 
Just yeah, and I would say a big part of that is that your subconscious mind the, or the aspects of your mind and body that you're not like consciously aware of or in control of tend to operate on things like visualization and emotion and symbolism. So those are all tend to be helpful. Mm, that is true. And so do you as an FE Dom naturally love people? Um, I'll answer that question in two ways because I think and I immediately see two ways you can answer that. Uh, I immediately, I love being around people. Um, and I easily see like delightful aspects of them if they're not, um, it's, or I should say it's more difficult to see delightful aspects of them if they're like in an extremely persistent negative emotional state. But even then I can see sort of past the like clouds of negative emotion, like beauty in them. Um, and then I would say the other way in which I naturally love people has, nothing to do with being an NI Dom, which is something I've found through those meditative practices that the awareness that you are that like observes all your thoughts and feelings has a sort of natural welcoming love for everything. It doesn't judge anything or like label a thing as bad. It just like accepts. And it's not quite the same as like the way we would like love and rejoice in a thing, but it's a sense of like peace that naturally accepts whatever is happening around you, including other people. Mm, that's beautiful. Did you always have that sense of peace or was it from finding your no. philosophy that brought you? <laughs> yeah, I, um, I grew up in a version of Christianity that was very intellectual and not very, um, like pragmatic or practitional, like didn't put an emphasis on like, uh, inner work or inner interaction with God and didn't put much of an emphasis on like um outer work like there or there was an emphasis on it but it wasn't frequently practiced of like taking care of the poor and stuff like that um it was more of like an intermittent event thing than like a, a, a like weekly activity and it took me like it took my belief shifting into a more like non-dual spirituality place uh where there was a lot more um pragmatic emphasis on different practices you can do for inner work and how you can interact with your emotions and thoughts and consciousness in order to um, experience that. But I will say the as soon as I started like practicing basic meditation techniques, which I'm still shocked, like no one ever explained, um, that arose very quickly. Like it wasn't hard to find once I was able to put my attention on the awareness that I exist and just on the consciousness that was aware of everything else, um, that arose very quickly and naturally. You're the most NF thing ever, Emerus. <laughs> How do you feel about FI doms and what is the communication with them? Hmm. My first thought is that they're they have an advantage and a disadvantage in manifesting their authentic self. The advantage I would say is the awareness of it and the fact that if you're able to show up authentic authentically in life, you are absolutely magnetic and powerful. Um, reality seems to want to play very happily with people who are fully authentic. On the other hand, um, I've also noticed that FI DOMs seem to have a much more immediate or intense experience of uh, conditioning and traumas and like unprocessed difficulties and stuff. Now I could be totally wrong about that, um, but that's what it has seemed like. And so the advantage of that is that all that stuff is more immediately available for them to process and grow from um, and accept and not, uh, you know, uh, demonize or uh, ignore, but it also makes it very difficult because it's like a person, as far as I can tell, it's like a person being immediately aware of every way in which the external world and their own internal experience of themselves is out of alignment with where they would like it to be. And so it's like a hypersensitivity and hypersensitivity has pros and cons. Mm, makes sense, makes sense. So there's a lot of MBTI folklore about ENFJs and INFJs. <laughs> what about your personal experience with this dynamic with the INFPs in your life? I would say it becomes very easy to um, 
show up for that person as someone in their life that is wholeheartedly accepting of their authentic self as much as I can be, um, who understands what it's like to be, uh, to not feel like reality or the social structure around you or even your own perceptions of yourself, like to not feel like those things line up with who you truly are and who you want to be. Um, and so that's very natural to me. Uh, it feels like, like when I see, I feel like uh, INFPs tend to feel somewhat like outsiders in the world that we live in and very uh, at home in an, in an almost like dreamlike or spiritual world or um, romantic world uh, to use the term like technically and artistically. And to me, it's very easy to see why that would be the case. Like this, the, the regular external world, as much as I find it relatively easy to interact with it, seems very, very strange to me. Like that sort of inner spiritual, romantic, uh, ideological, dreamlike world seems more natural and normal and native to me. Um, in the other direction, like the main um, difficulty that I've had with INFPs in my life is well, I'm not sure I can put it into words. I think it has to do with how in that world they tend to be. And so I end up feeling sometimes like I can only share like half of myself with them. Because if we're like, let's use FE and NI, like it's easy for me to share that world with them through NI. But then the part of me that wants to go and be completely immersed in the external world as well, it's more difficult for me to share that aspect of myself with them. Now, if they're wanting to go and explore that, I feel like I can um, sort of be the one who invites them along to do that. Uh, but then their ability to engage with it is lar largely seems to be a function of like how much they've developed parts of themselves that aren't necessarily as natural to them in the sense that like if they've gotten really good at interacting with the the like social world and the like high energy like um frequent social interaction out out and about like partying and dancing or if we, if we can use that colloquially um if they're really good at that then it's very fascinating or it's extra fascinating because they're able to bring their authentic self and manifest it in that world. If they're, if they haven't developed that very much, um, it becomes a challenge to sort of dance with them in that world. Mm, well put, Emerus. I find with some INFPs, especially if they're Enneagram 4, there's this element where they'll get really attached sometimes. And then if something happens, they can get really detached. So it's almost like this swing from feeling very close to you, then feeling very distant from you, depending on whether or not you resonate with their values. Um, for some of them, not all of them. And that's something I think NFJs might struggle with, with NFPs. Do you have any idea why we might struggle with that? Because I feel like that resonates with me, but I haven't figured out what it is that makes that challenging for us. Because NFJs are quick to compromise themselves. So mm -hmm. if the NFP is pushing for their values to be met, the NFJ feels a pressure to be less of themselves. And mm -hmm. that's not healthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Because I've noticed, like, I don't want to be uh, too harsh on the NFPs and stuff. And I've, no I've been trying to figure out what is it that's my contribution to this dynamic. And I'm noticing it might be that, like, willingness to compromise myself. Mm. And so what is happiness for you? Mm. Man, guys, y'all are going to make me have an existential crisis and figure out my life plan in one interview. Uh, inner peace. Like I've noticed that it's inner peace that gives me a sort of continual sanctuary from which I can observe and enjoy the beauty of the world and love and be of service to other people um, calmly and uh, without a fear that I'm not doing enough or that I'm not going to say the right thing or not do the right thing. Just a sort of um, ability to, or an ability to rest in beauty and then be of service from that place. That's gorgeous. Inner peace, have you ever experienced that in your life? 
Oh yeah. Um, it's one of the things that drew me to meditation. It's like, you'll, I've intermittently gotten into that state of consciousness of just, um, I've described it as like, imagine if you're dreaming and something scary happens or less than ideal happens, but you're aware that you're dreaming. So you know that this less than ideal thing is just another aspect of you and that you, there's nothing like preventing you from changing it or at least um, relating to it with peace and with love because it's just you. Um, that's what it, that's a state of consciousness that has happened to me repeatedly in and after meditation. And um, it's also quite delightful because it's almost uh, humorous because you're noticing it, it feels like uh, the consciousness that you are is the consciousness that everyone else is. And there's almost a playful, like, how did I put it? Um, in some traditions of Hinduism, Shiva is seen as like the chief deity or the representation of the chief deity. And I'm very ignorant of Hinduism, so please pardon my lack of knowledge. But I remember uh, a, an Alan Watts quote that stuck with me where he was like, every time someone walks up to me uh, I, and says, hi, I'm so-and-so, I do this, I'm this person. And he goes, ah, ha, ha, what a funny way that God has appeared to me today. <laughs> or uh, being like, ah, mm -mm, Shiva, I recognize you. You're not fooling anyone. Who you really are is the divine consciousness. I, you're not fooling me. Um, and there's an almost funny element to that to me because in that state of consciousness, it's like you can see the personality and the per and the what we understand as the person and then you can also see beyond that like the consciousness that's almost has its like eyes shining in laughter at you going like do you like my new mask or you like who i'm playing today um and it's just funny because we take the personalities and personas so seriously and it's like a bunch of people on a stage uh playing different characters and getting so into them and there's an almost humor where you, you're like, it's hard sometimes to not break character and just be like, this is really funny that we're all really invested in these characters. Yeah. So yeah, that's some of my weirder spiritual side, but that's kind of how that manifests for me. There's some sort of inner peace that comes from noticing the facade of day-to-day -day living. Instead of taking the labels so seriously, you learn to take them lightly because yeah. they aren't you. You realize that a lot of things aren't you. The things that stress you are out are not you. And when you learn to let those things go, what's left is just your consciousness. What mm -hmm. people say is we're not the sky. I mean, sorry, we're not the cloud, but we're, we are the sky. Mm -hmm. So you are not the stressful thoughts floating through your head, but you are the thing observing those thoughts. And mm -hmm. so there's a type of peace that comes from that because you realize that you don't have to over identify with any thought you have. And so there's mm -hmm. a freedom in not needing to identify with anything that would hold you down if you hold, held on it, to it too tightly. Mm -hmm. That's definitely. Yeah. And so Denzel asks, do you have a GF? <laughs> <laughs> Denzel, I'm going to have a talk with you about this. <laughs> Every time in the past, when I've done the videos, he's like, are you single? Do you have a GF? Uh, I do not at the time. No, I don't have like a life partner relationship. Why doesn't anyone ever ask me this question? I never get asked this question. And I'm Do you have a GF or a life partner? <laughs> I don't. No, I don't. You know, I'm taking Enneagram courses right now. And whenever I complain about certain things like this, people ask me, are you a type two? Because this is like twos are going like, wait, why is everyone getting this type of attention and likability and, and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> one more data point to add to the contemplation huh mm -hmm. yeah salty choice <laughs> <laughs> that is genuinely frustrating though like i i certainly empathize with feeling like everyone else is getting asked the question that you deeply care about and then like not turning that same question to you um i think that happens with NFs a lot um because in our own ways we tend to seem like we have a lot of things all together and uh we've got all that stuff figured out and so it I've noticed it's fairly common for people to not ask those same kinds of um 
kind of like how's your life and how's the important things in your life kind of questions. Mm. Yeah, the, the NFs are the ones probing that from other people, but NFs don't get asked that themselves. And they're like, great, I am offering the deep conversation to the person. The person's not sending the ball back. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see a utopian society? A society in which the vast majority of the members are conscious of the unity of either every member of that society or of all things, and who operate on a principle of not infringing on the free will of others. So this is where, as humans, we've had difficulty because we have a million and one ways to create the ideas and perceptions of separation. And this leads to all sorts of difficulties. Um, when we're able to perceive like the basic unity that we share, um, whether you want to see that as the interconnectedness of all things or as the oneness of all things or simply as uh, every other person is just you if you were born in their body and raised in the way they were and experienced what they experienced. Um, that unity uh, gives you a sense that your desires and your freedom of choice are no more or no less valid than anyone else's. And so it leads to this principle where you're very careful not to infringe on the free will of others, whether that's um, not offering service unless they've implicitly or explicitly asked, um, not offering your opinion unless you're implicitly or explicitly asked, or at least being very cautious that you're not disturbing their journey of life by like you know setting yourself up as a teacher and then um telling them that you are the authority and that they uh as opposed to telling them that they have within themselves the ability to discern truth but then also not attempting to secure um provision or peace through exertion of power over others this is the other thing that we really struggle with especially in the modern day where we're very aware now of the need to create peace and create abundant provision for everyone and that kind of thing. Um, but we're still often operating on the model that the way to do that is to get into positions of power and use that power to force other people to take care of each other. And as far as I can tell, that doesn't work. Um, even among movements that are trying to like uh, create liberation from the perspective of like a, a injustice of the inequality in society perspective, there's an idea that if you don't um, simultaneously teach that everyone has the right to uh, their own freedom of choice and that exertion of power over others isn't the way, then you just create a new system of oppression. So I think that that's where we really have to shift out of that thinking and shift into a thinking where you band together with people who are already on board with that and then help take care of each other, but being careful not to infringe on each other's freedom of choice or exert power over each other. Yeah, there are a lot of win-lose structures or lose-lose structures that are set up in society. And ultimately, the best result would be a win-win. <laughs> and that would come from not seeing each side as an adversary. <coughs> oh, I need to drink a lot. <laughs> Um, so people tend to kind of see a us versus Islam, and if you always see that, then you'll never be on the side of both people. And mm -hmm. it's the NF mentality to want a win-win for everyone. It's like, I want our side and their side to win, mm -hmm. which is why there are a lot of NFs who believe in non-dualism, because it's about seeing everyone as, impo as important as you are. Mm -hmm. Because in some way, if you were born as them, you would do the same things as them, given the same mind as them. So it's this holistic compassion that I see really prevalent among. Yeah. And to be clear, that doesn't mean that um, that will, you know, just pie in the sky, convince everyone who wants power over others to stop playing that game. Um, but it's that if you step in to play that game, you perpetuate the system. If you model and act out a different way of playing the game that doesn't require power over others, you create a new system or a new uh, way of living. And that actually does have an effect. Like even in 
like you can't, I, I would put it this way, you can't directly change another person's mind or directly help them to grow, but you can model a different way of living. And um, your, not just your example, but your existence as that different way of living is actually far more powerful than we tend to assume because we're kind of, as a society, stuck in a thinking that like the way to change things is to get power. Modeling is effective too, if it inspires other people. What are your hobbies? Uh, my favorite hobby is probably Dungeons and Dragons or tabletop role playing games in general. I love the social aspect of it. I love, I tend to be the, the DM or person running the game. So I love getting to create something that I find beautiful and intriguing and thought provoking and then share that with my friends and see how they react to it. It's almost like how when you have a really good conversation and you're like sharing these fascinating ideas and seeing how it sparks ideas in this other person, it's like that, but in a game form. Um, and there's also entertaining aspects of it. Like it's an incredible way to generate a ton of inside jokes with your friends. It's really entertaining to see them work on like creative problem solving because it's almost like an open world video game but with no actual limits other than like the laws of physics and whatever the agreed upon like setting is uh for other hobbies i really enjoy exercise in general but i particularly like uh weightlifting and yoga as maintenance and then things like dancing although i'm not very good at it uh and like individual sport like one person sports like rock climbing or free running are really fun to me uh I always try to think of other hobbies. I suppose like learning and um, attempting to articulate or teach what I've learned is sort of a hobby for me. Like that's continually what I'm drawn back to when I have free time and generally like enjoying the company of others. Uh, that's one of the reasons I like just going out into social situations. One of the reasons I like, um, I'm not really actually a big fan of like, partying and going out dancing but i like if you go to a social public place that has like a good atmosphere where there can be genuine connection between people mm, solid and so i consistently hear that enfjs mm -hmm. have dark thoughts when alone how much of that is true in your experience mm. well in one sense i don't know how much i can answer this only as an enfj because I've had depressive episodes since at least like high school. So those dark thoughts are very easy for me to have when alone. Um, I don't want to say easy. It's more like when the difficulties of life catch up with me, uh, it's easy for all of that to hit me at once and for me to have a ton of dark thoughts, uh, which is one of the reasons I thought it was a nine, an Enneagram nine for a while. Uh, because I didn't tend to notice when all that was building up or when I was upset or angry um, until it all hit at once. Um, I think the other, so I, I see two other aspects of this as an ENFJ. One is that it's easy for us to understand a dark perspective. Um, the two ways I've seen this for me is it, it was easy for me to recognize what like a truly villainous or evil manifestation of myself would look like. Um, and I don't know this for sure because I've never, you know, explored attempting to become that. But I remember finding out that Hans from Frozen was usually typed as an EFJ. And I was like, yeah, if I was a villain, that'd probably be my plan. Just seduce the local power structure and then insert yourself into the uh, best position and use your social ability to get everybody on your side. Um, or the other even more scary one was, and this, I don't know if this was because it felt like an ENFJ thing or it just felt like I could easily empathize with darkness. Um, if anyone's seen the Netflix series, You, I've only seen like the first few episodes of it, but I remember watching the first episode and being like, oh, I understand exactly where this person is coming from and where their mindset is at. And I don't like it. Like, I don't like that I can see. Um, it's sort of like, I, I've heard people say it's a, a good way of understanding and having a healthy like respect for and being willing to deal with and not give into your shadow side is to understand that like given the right circumstances you could become like a nazi prison guard and to 
be able to see that and be like, oh, I understand how I could get to that point um, was both disturbing, but also I would say helpful. We, we have a difficulty, I would say, in our, uh, in our society's approach to like our psychology and psychological health that often involves labeling the shadow side as bad. And that doesn't help. What tends to help as far as I can tell is responding to the shadow side with love and understanding this is also something I contain. Um, but that comes along with an understanding that like you are not controlled by your inner world. You actually get to choose what portions of yourself you manifest. And those aspects of you have their roots in good things. Like all the fear you experience often has a root in like the parts of you that are very focused on trying to help you survive. And that's a big part of like forgiving that part of yourself too, where you can see, oh, I acted this way, whether it's really dark or just kind of dark, because from the way I was seeing the world at the time, that was a totally valid way to act. I believed I was in danger. I believed that um, like this was the only way towards happiness. And if you can see that and see that that was a necessary part of your learning process, that facilitates healing of that side of yourself. Um, and then the third, I think there was one more way I see ENFJs relating to dark thoughts. Um, I think when, I, when I've gotten frustrated with the social structures or the world in which I live, it's very easy for me to go to dark thoughts about like, life isn't worth living, or this is all just too much. But and I could see easily how that could be directed at certain structures. And for me, sometimes it has, like when I've experienced, um, I experienced a lot of emotional difficulty, partly as a result of my like uh, evangelical Christian upbringing. And so there's been times where I've had like very angry uh, reactions, especially when alone to that structure. Um, but for me, it mostly gets directed toward reality itself, where when there's a buildup of difficulty, um, or a buildup of the perception of difficulty other people are experiencing, I tend to experience um, a sort of bout of lashing out emotionally at reality, being like, this isn't fair. Like, none of this is worth the suffering. Like, um, you know, if there's a God out there, I'm really mad at you for doing this. Um, and I remember that was one of the first times I experienced like a depressive episode was basically that. A friend of mine, uh, his mother had died of cancer. And I was just like, you know what? I'm done playing your stupid games, God, universe, reality, whatever. Like this isn't, nothing justifies this. So I've noticed that for those things, the same principles apply where it's like, if you try to shove those thoughts away, it doesn't work. If you instead welcome them and either just observe them until you see that they're not you and they're just uh, arising and falling, or um, if you dive into them and, and try to understand, like ask them, what part of me are you speaking for? And like, how did you come to believe this? And why are you saying this? You'll often find that there's a scared and hurt part of you that is behind that angry or dark thought. Um, and you basically, in whatever way works for you, like send that part of you love. Like I've often done that by, um, I often get visualizations of like, my that portion of myself as a child or as a wounded animal or something and like uh giving it a hug or like being like uh gentle and non-aggressive with it um and basically as far as i can tell what that does is it gives the signal to that part of your mind that it's not in danger anymore it doesn't need to be afraid because it's kind of love and fear are kind of like opposite signals um and that tends to facilitate more of the healing doesn't make it go away automatically but that's kind of the process that i've seen for dealing with the dark side of yourself yeah it's very nf to go with most scenarios and to go like the best response is to respond with love and mm -hmm. nf will will go like most solutions are best solved with love integrating it in some way in some form mm -hmm. because without love there's just trauma and mm -hmm to heal kind of the collective trauma of the world is through the mechanism of love. And then the STs have stomach pain from hearing the NF say that. <laughs> <laughs> I do think one of the reasons that happens is that we tend to think of, we have a very limited, our, our definition of love is so like scattered and limited. Um, another word I might use is like 
acceptance. And that doesn't mean like acceptance of it's okay for this thing to just stay. But like, let's say you want to address the problem by moving more into what you truly want. That means more full acceptance of what you truly want and more full movement toward it. And then the acceptance of the negative thing that you don't want uh, isn't necessarily like, oh, I'm just okay with this thing staying around forever. It's can also be like, um, I'm not going to sit here and try to fight a portion of myself. I'm going to accept that this is existing right now and it's not in alignment with what I want, but I'm just going to move toward what I want instead of acting like I have to um, go to war against this portion of myself, which then just keeps you in the conflict thing. So even if you see the acceptance as sort of ignoring being like, all right, that's there, not going to give it the time of day. Like that's a perfectly valid method of love you're it's just you not um rejecting and fighting the reality that exists right now yeah love is acceptance because it's loving it as it is so it is enough mm -hmm. as it is and mm -hmm. acceptance requires love to make it sustainable um mm -hmm. and so bubble puppy asks how do you use your a slot t um I don't very much. <laughs> I would say I tend to do it on the fly or like in process. Like I don't tend to do it through extensive planning. Most of my extensive planning tends to be a TI thing where it's attempting to apply a system of logic to how to uh, show up in the pragmatic world. And then as I find that like a thing works primarily filtered through, or doesn't work primarily filtered through FE. Um, I tend to use TE to try to just generate a new plan, but it's usually an area I'm fairly weak at if it's not a social thing um, for the other stuff, like for non-social systems. Uh, I just don't tend to interact with them very much. I just don't tend to attempt to change them. Um, I may it may also help. I, Joyce, you may know this more than I do. Could you give any examples of how an eight slot TE might show up? Hmm. It might show up in the form of not really wanting to change something unless it's like a, related to social structures or people in some way. So it yes. Okay. So with that. I could go on that and just uh, whether it's politics, for example, where I look at the political system and I'm just like, this doesn't seem like a system that that is easily changeable, maybe on the local level, get involved. And I do think that's worth doing. Um, but the way that we tend to think about changing politics, like campaign for my party and get the right person in office, that kind of thing. I'm just kind of like, mm, I don't see this as a system that I'm interested in attempting to change. Um, and in the sense of like, I tend to see it as somewhat uh, hopeless through that method, but then hopeful through like social organizing and um, like humanitarian action. So I would lean more towards those things, which are again, more social. Um, and then, yeah, like most of the time that stuff that's non-social tends to just be a background thing for me. So like, you know, we could be using terribly outdated technology and I'm not usually inclined to be like, oh, here's how we could update this to be more efficient. I'm just like, it's sort of working. So I mean, that seems like a waste of energy for me to try to do that. Or not a waste of energy. I just don't feel like it's high on my priority list. Yeah. Eight slot TE also shows up in how ENFJs can be late when they're helping someone with their, with their issues. So it really happens to me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So instead of being TE pragmatic with time management, if someone's in need or needs that FE, it, the FE DOM, ENFJ will just run to help them. Mm -hmm. And so how do you view TI as a demon? What life struggles do you attribute to TI? Uh, quick recap. I think I said a little bit of this earlier, but yeah, I, I mainly view it as reality is um the location ti and thoughts in general are a map and they can be very helpful if you use the map to get you to a part of the location and to um 
help you navigate to the place you want to be. But if you look at the map instead of the instead of reality itself too much, if you look at thoughts or lot or like internal logic structures instead of experience, um, either on the journey to where you want to be, or if you get to where you want to be and then don't put down the map and actually like interact with the experience of reality, then you tend to that's where a lot of the negative experience of life tends to come from. As far as I can tell, we start identifying with our thoughts, identifying with our emotions, not being willing to actually experience reality. Absolutely. That is important to think about. And so in a social setting, what do you unconsciously or easily pick up on? Where does your focus go to? I easily pick up on like, who's in a position of influence, but also almost always see, not see, I get a feeling or sense if there is any level of insecurity or instability in the person who's in a position of influence. It's almost like looking at the top of a pyramid and like sensing that it's unstable. Um, and wow, that sounds like I'm plotting to take over things. <laughs> um, not what I meant, but, uh, I also tend to pick up on like people who are outside the social net or social interaction circle. Um, my focus actually tends to go to all of the, well, my awareness goes to all of those. And then my focus tends to go to people who are kind of on the same wavelength as me. Um, whether that's the wavelength of the role I'm playing at the time, like let's say I am there to um, learn about a particular group or uh, be a point of social connection between two groups, then my focus will immediately go to the best opportunities to play that role. Or if I'm just there for my own enjoyment, it'll go to like who here seems like they're kind of uh, showing up in the social scene in a similar way to me. Um, which usually looks like people who are able to interact with it, but aren't necessarily immersed in it, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you think of compromise in terms of relations or friendships? I mean, my instinct is usually to just try to create autonomy within the relationship. Um, not, it's not always possible, but I think that we tend to leap to compromise without considering whether that's the desired structure of relations. So for example, let's say you're living with someone who has a very different like preference on decoration or the way that chores are done. My instinct would to be like, okay, what's the most important things to you? The most important rooms, the most important chores, the mo like, and then let's just divide up uh, where we have autonomy in our chores and our living space as far as this aspect of our interaction, so that um, there's not a need for um, a compromise where neither person is particularly satisfied or because one of the things I've noticed is there's a kind of compromise where you can blend what you want or where what you want isn't intense enough that it really matters. And that is a perfectly great place to compromise. To me, that's largely about like saving energy where it's like, we don't need to argue about this um, or like spend the next day debating how to do this. But if it's something that's important to you, like I don't tend to see relationships as like, we're blending together um, except in the places where we're intentionally choosing to blend together. And that's sort of like a, um, almost like an activity. Like if you, you don't, you're not um, dancing constantly in a romantic relationship, but when you choose to dance, you're moving together. And so I see it kind of like that. When you find that there's a place where you can dance together, dance together. When you find that there's a place where you don't care about the differences, Okay, just like let it slide. When you find that there's something that's really important to you, I would say try to find a way of creating autonomy and um, not feeling like you have to blend every aspect of your life. Mm. Yeah, it's 
love can sometimes be like parallel lines. You're walking mm -hmm. side by side each other. You don't need to merge, but it's almost mm -hmm. like you grow together. Mm -hmm. And so what sparked your interest in MBTI? Mm. Um, <laughs> the basic attempting to find my identity in university, probably. Uh, I came across it like sophomore year and primarily I've just always been fascinated with personality systems. Uh, largely, I think, because I don't have an immediate sense of like my identity or authenticity. And so personality systems often helped me figure out like, oh, that's how I show up in the world and how I tend to think. Okay. Um, and then when I looked into personality hacker and started talking with Denzel about MBTI, what I liked about it was that it gave you a system of sort of what your superpowers are in life. And I had never had a very strong sense of like, oh, I'm really good at this. Even things that I know like sort of technically or intellectually that I'm good at, I still don't often feel emotionally like I am. Like people are usually like, oh, you're good at talking or you're good at listening. I'm just like, okay, I guess I don't feel like it. Um, so having a system that like laid that out plainly, I'm like, okay, I can more easily believe this. And then I got into Enneagram and it was just like, here's all your fears and shortcomings, which is really helpful for growth, but man, it's rough. Yeah. MRS is an Enneagram 3 sexual, by the way. Mm -hmm. So how does your circle of friends look like? Do you have a lot of different friend mm -hmm. groups? Yes. And this is one of the difficulties that I have because I also have a lot of um, different levels of intimacy among those friend groups. And it's almost never because, you know, I don't trust one friend group or like to be as vulnerable or something like that. But um, with FE, I often show up in a way that's going to make the other person comfortable and that's vibing with the current social situation. And if someone doesn't push to get to know the other aspects of me, they'll tend to see like that particular aspect, which to me is perfectly fine. Like I don't feel a need to manifest every aspect of myself to every one of my friends. Um, but I also don't, um, I also, I think would be remiss if I didn't have any friends that I could do that with. So I tend to have like friends who have, um, shown an interest in knowing every aspect of me, which is largely a matter of like, you feel like you really vibe with this person and you understand each other really well. And you both have time to commit to this kind of interaction. Um, and then there's tons and tons of other friends who I either, um, know through a particular activity or from a particular time in my life, or just we, when we hang out, there's not really a tendency to engage in the things that tends to produce that, those other levels of intimacy for me, like the extensive 3 a.m. conversation things. Um, but also a lot of it, I think, comes down to, to use, again, like woohoo, new age language, like how closely your vibration matches their vibration how much in harmony you are naturally because as far as I've found, there are people that you just uh, immediately resonate and harmonize with and immediately understand each other. And that tends to be what I'm really drawn to because I don't see friendship as like a, a source of security or like, personal stability necessarily or it's not the ideal source of it it's like i see those things as coming from friendship when you're in need of them but then seeking them internally so finding people with whom you're already in very close alignment so that you can more easily help each other become who you are and who you want to be those are my most intimate friend groups and then it's easy for me to make friends or acquaintances or just friendly interactions with almost anyone. So that just spreads out in lots of different groups and rings around me. Mm, you're a people charmer, you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you at any point mistype yourself and why? Mm. 
I think the only thing I've gotten close to that is sometimes thinking I was an INFJ because I do tend to spend a lot of time alone and tend to strongly use an I. Uh, so other than that, no, I don't think I ever did. I tested as an ENFJ and read the like profile of one. I was like, yep, this is definitely what I am. And it's, I've never been given reason to think otherwise, but I definitely ride the line between like introversion and extroversion. Mm. Arcadian Fox asks, how do your interactions with ISTPs and ISTJs generally go? Mm. And how do you avoid conflict with these? <laughs> <laughs> I shut up. I stop trying to make them see the world the way I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, I don't know for sure because I, I'm not particularly great at typing people, but um. I once worked uh, with a boss who I think was an ISTJ. And one of my greatest difficulties was it would seem like they had very little ability to see other people's perspectives and see the validity of other people's perspectives. And it made me angry um, because I was still, well, in, in many ways still am, uh, dealing with the idea that I have to convince other people to think the right way or to like think the way that's going to help the most people like I'm supposed to change people or something um and I think the other aspect of that is a certain amount of insecurity in my own perspective like I don't uh I don't have just a completely settled like I know what I believe and I am a hundred percent certain of it um, and I'm 100% certain of who I am and who I want to be. So I've sometimes sought a sense of like validation in trying to like present why my perspectives are um, have the best arguments behind them or something. And generally, I would say, one, if you're finding yourself unable to work within the framework provided by an ISTJ, like let's say there is one that's your boss and you're just like, I just can't work with this person. It's perfectly valid for you to draw boundaries, um, which largely consists of like you figuring out what is important to you and then uh, like refusing to budge on that and being kind of fearless about that where you're not, um, you're not allowing like fear of, oh no, like what, what if I am not approved of by these people or what if I even lose my job or something like being able to create a sense of stability where you can be authentic about what you truly want and what you're really not okay with. Um, and to basically find ways to address what's keeping you from doing that. What are you afraid of and how can you be willing to not necessarily make that fear go away, but not be afraid of the fear allow the fear to be there and still go after what you truly want. But then it, other than that, like I've noticed that most of the conflicts tend to arise when, at least for me, when I want this other person to change their way of being, um, because very often what they're doing doesn't actually directly affect me, but I'm like getting upset with them about what they're doing. And that's just kind of like, I would say the, the biggest help with that is one, shifting out of a perspective that says like the best way to make your life better or other people's lives better is to like change other people's minds. Um, and then two, seeing how they're bringing very valuable things with their perspective. And um, there's, how do I, it's that acceptance thing. It's like the universe or reality doesn't reject anything, even things we would find abhorrent um, and see if you can get in touch with that part of yourself that isn't demanding that anything change. Which mm. I would say is that business. Yeah. So being okay with the current state of reality. Mm -hmm. A lot of and then times. If, go ahead. Well, if it's too, if, if it is infringing on you, making you unable to live the way you're wanting to live, boundaries, if those aren't working, whether because you're unable to set them or because the other person just continues to violate them walking away. Mm, yeah, knowing your threshold. Perfect. And so what is your view on Jung's individuation process? So the individuation process is becoming more you, becoming more amorous. 
Or maybe mm -hmm. becoming more you is actually letting go of the label of Emerus and becoming the you behind that. Well, it depends on what you mean by the label Emerus, right? So if you mean, I would say the true you is what flows out of you naturally without you thinking about it. Um, and that could also like you have to recognize that there's going to be a lot of negative emotions and difficulties and conditioning that's going to flow out of you for a while and you work on healing those either through like observing their absurdity and unreality or you do that healing process of like diving into where they're coming from and healing them with love and whatever methods that you find helpful um and eventually like the authentic you will just start uh flowing through you and that's really a big part of it is that you you you've heard people say like get out of your own way it's largely a process of like observing um what's happening and what's flowing out of you and what's happening around you without feeling like you have to take control of it um i would say that's the quickest way to both discover and manifest who you truly are i'm not familiar enough with young's methods for doing that i'd see like meditation and um healing of the shadow and emotional balancing practices as the main methods that i find helpful but i don't know if you know anything about how young would recommend one do does the individualization process it's a, becoming a more balanced enfj so becoming less one-sided in whatever way that is for you it's quite wild all the ways that we self-sabotage without meaning to it's almost like coming into awareness the reality of what you kind of self-sabotage by accident it's taking accountability for ruining your own life in certain ways which is a pretty challenging process because it's hard to take total responsibility and be like everything i experience is now my responsibility of how i respond to it but um the other thing about becoming more balanced that i would say i do this through uh what's kind of an emotional balancing meditation where you basically look at the end of the day look back over the day find all the places where an emotion or an event like took you out of a sense of centeredness and uh, peace anything that triggered you and then try to uh recreate that emotion within you or ask that it arise again within you and let it intensify until you see that it's just not particularly helpful so you have to like bless and accept it like it's okay for this thing to exist and then when it gets so strong you're like this isn't moving me toward anything i want that's when you ask for the opposite thing to arise within you and what and you don't try to create it you just kind of sit in observation until the other thing arises and then you see how you contain both things and you kind of step back a little bit and see how your observer perspective is almost like outside or observing both things so the goal here is to become more centered uh, less reactive to see that you contain all the full range of positive and negative emotion and that none of that experience has to like knock you out of a sense of a state of centeredness and peace Mm, yeah, that is true. Realizing what triggers you and learning how to approach it in a healthier way so mm -hmm. it doesn't control you. Oftentimes, sometimes we don't know how much our triggers control how we we actually navigate mm -hmm. our way through life. Sometimes there's a lifelong trigger people react to and it, it comes out in the form where people can call it lazy, but maybe mm -hmm. it's they're not lazy, they're not procrastinating, they're just triggered in some way that they're unaware of how to solve yet. Mm -hmm. And that does, I mean, to be fair, that method also relies on the assumption that your mind is always unconsciously trying to grow and process those triggers and heal them. And that the main way it does that is through experiencing. So allowing yourself to fully experience what it is that's triggering you. It's the idea that your mind will use that to process the healing. Mm. So as you learn more about your own identity, do you feel more protective, competitive, or the general need for validation, or do you feel more secure? Both. <laughs> as I learn more about what it is I desire, the same patterns of defensiveness, of uh, protectiveness, need for validation that were always there, like manifest 
in a way that's more clearly connected to what I desire, as opposed to like manifesting in ways that I'm like, I don't know why I'm feeling protective or defensive at this. Um, but then as I work on healing those triggers and as I attempt to move out of the thinking mind and into the heart and into like observance instead of and responding instead of reacting um then i feel more secure but it's not it's more like that space of observing is already a hundred percent completely secure and i'm just able to experience that more and more frequently and have as like uh aspects of that bleed into the rest of my life, even when I'm not in that state of consciousness of just completely observing. So it's not like I'm building security. It's like discovering that I already contain perfect security and then um, going and resting in that over and over and over until it gradually permeates my entire life. Mm. What stage of that are you in right now? <laughs> um, I would say the stage where I'm very aware of the end goal and of the accessibility of it, but also very aware of um, like emotional blockages and wounds and triggers that have to do with um, my desire to live a life that's going to be inherently challenging um, in the sense of like accepting and willingness to live life instead of rejecting life in general. Um, and as well with like, um, I, I would say that's more frequent. Uh, the less frequent blockages and difficulties have to do with uh, like being able to view the people around me with a hundred percent love, but that's easier to do in one-on-one -on -one relationships. It's much harder for me to do that in a social or group context because I often feel um, a desire, like a anger at the social structures that I perceive in the world. And so being well, I, I would say that to get to that state of a complete open heart, like observance, uh, you have to, the main forms of like blockage to that goal are like acceptance of yourself as a sexual being, acceptance of a desire to live life in general, um, being able to perceive one-on-one -on -one relationships from an attitude of love and acceptance and being able to perceive like formal or group relationships from an attitude of love and acceptance. And then there may occasionally be blockages where you're like having difficulty just applying that acceptance universally because there's something in you that's still like, it's not okay for this thing to exist right now. Like it needs to be different right now as opposed to it's okay for it to exist right now. I'm going to work on moving towards it being different. Mm, yeah, in some ways it's returning back to a childlike state because when you're mm -hmm. a child, you have an easier time having a open heart. And as you get older, having an open heart is hard because people bring a wrecking ball to your heart or a machete to your heart in it. You have a jadedness sometimes. And so mm -hmm. part of spirituality is recentering yourself so you can mm -hmm. open the gates of your heart without fearing uh, pain because a pain is a part of the price you pay for love mm -hmm. and pain is the part of the price you pay for feeling alive mm -hmm. and so being centered is, is almost being closer to your sense of aliveness mm -hmm. definitely and so what makes oh wait sorry that we already went through this question okay. how do you care about uh, what do you care about the most mm -hmm. I'm also sorry, everyone, if I seem a little slower than usual. I sometimes get less sleep on certain nights than others. <laughs> and so you'll see that it'll be apparent. But yeah, continue, Amaris. I would say that that statement I made from earlier, resting in beauty while finding ways to love and serve other people is what I care about the most. Um, it's sort of a combination of almost always very intensely feeling the pain of people on earth in general um, and specific people. And um, also being very sensitive to the beauty of um, 
unity and love and the magnificence of reality uh, and a desire to experience that, but to also help other people heal and experience that, particularly because our current state of existence as humans feels very insane to me and not in like a judgmental way, but in a way that it's like, we're so close to perceiving like the true nature of reality and like resting in love and being able to actually move out of the confusion that we are so frequently in. And um, it's like a, a lot of our, well, in general, it's just hard for us to do that here. There's a lot of pain. And so I care very much about like trying to help people um, find encouragement in the midst of the pain and to heal if they're wanting to do that in the mm -hmm. way that they find helpful. Yeah, you're there to heal people through the power of being able to see beauty and <laughs> help them get through that. The the NFs tend to play the role of the mentor, the advisor, the almost spiritual leader type of teacher roles in a lot of places. And so what do you care most of? It's almost nurturing people's souls. That's what Definitely. it sounds like. Yes, that's very accurate. And I would say one last thing. From my perspective, I don't think anyone can directly heal another person. I think they can present them with a a different um, perspective that's closer to wholeness or health. And then that person has complete freedom to accept or reject based on where they're at in their own growth journey. Mm, that is true. You can't make a person heal. Mm -hmm. They have to choose it for themselves. And so ENFJs are known to do a lot for others. What is it that you get out of the interactions with family, friends, mm -hmm. or colleagues? Well, there's frequently moments with like the closest people in my life that I feel like, let, let's take that resting in beauty kind of thing. Um, For me, like you could visualize that as like, think of the, I don't know, the elven cities from Lord of the Rings or something that are very ethereal and beautiful and put that on a mountaintop uh, that's above the sea and beneath the night sky of stars. Like that's a sort of visual of the place of beauty that I'm just, that I wish to rest in. And then very frequently with interactions with other people who I'm very close to, their love or their perception of the beauty of reality will take me to that place of beauty again, or I'll have the opportunity to invite them to go rest in, in my particular perspective of beauty as well. Um, and then I also get a sense of like, when I'm, when I'm listening to a person who's experiencing difficulty and is at a point where they're ready to attempt to grow or use that difficulty to grow as opposed to just kind of being stuck in a loop where they can't find a way out of the challenge they're facing and can't uh, find a way to new thoughts or new feelings. Um, when they're desiring to grow and I'm listening to them in a way that either gives them the opportunity to figure out what they want to do or in a way that just gives them comfort, I usually walk away from that feeling like, okay, whatever else I did today, whatever else happens this week, um, I'm glad I was alive and it was worth being here. And I did something um, like that was what was worth doing. Mm. There's something really similar about us and it's that perception of wanting to rest in beauty. Um, oftentimes I'll tell people, I kind of think everything is beautiful in its own way. If you look close enough, there is a beauty and no one really gets that except I feel like you get that. And so how would you distinguish from INFJ in your experience? Hmm. I feel a very strong and sometimes constant pull towards, <laughs> full of paradoxes, sometimes constant, uh, pull towards manifesting the 
inner world of NI into the social world. Um, I often have difficulty when I'm doing very well in the inner world, but not doing as well at like actually manifesting or pursuing that in the social world. Um, I would also say my way of, I would say I'm more prone to attempting to avoid difficulty through like sense experiences, like whether it's exercise or like addictive behaviors or like um, food or like anything that's sensory. Um, ENFJs, because we have SE in our third spot, tend to jump to that when we don't want to deal with the internal processing. It's like bypassing NI. Um, and so it's easy. I would say it might be easier for me to um, like ignore what I truly want and ignore what's going on internally and just keep like playing in the social world and the like physical world without, um, without acknowledging that some part of me is like, this isn't what we really want. Like we're not fully in alignment with what, uh, with the path that we want to walk right now. We're just like ignoring the problems and just being like, yeah, let's just go meet with people and like go have fun experiences and like, you know, go to a theme park or something like just do something that's distracting. Um, and I'm not sure how I, I, if I remember correctly, TI ends up being the like avoidance one for INFJs, but I'm not certain. Um, TI is the relief role for INFJs. So they might actually have a more readily critical side. Whereas mm -hmm. ENFJs, sometimes ENFJ criticism is more pointed towards themselves or pointed towards people who upset the group. It Definitely. Does. Yeah. So yeah. I'm very like, I tend to be very non-critical of other people unless they're specifically like making themselves an enemy of the group or like a, a danger to the group really. Um, and that, but I tend to be extremely, extremely critical of myself. Like almost all my dissatisfaction with life, rather than placing blame on like another person or a circumstance, it's like immediately placed on me. And part of that I think also comes from the Enneagram three tendencies. Yeah. ENFJs are also more likely to be workaholics, not in all cases, but I know a lot of ENFJ workaholics. And that's because when you have FE first slot, it's a desire to kind of keep moving with your SE. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a quickness to action, almost to the point of burning out a lot of the time. Yeah, I would definitely uh, resonate with that to the point where even when I'm trying to slow down and like move more into the internal world and rest like i'll be instead like doing research on how to best slow down and rest and like just doing more and more interesting and so what qualities makes one stand out to you in a sea of people mm. a sense of settledness about who they are and about like being non-reactive to others um like that's very beautiful and magnetic to me that there's um an ability to like even if they're experiencing emotional reactions to not like present those in the external world um to like in in a social setting like they may like i think it would also be unhealthy if they weren't ever expressing those externally but to wait to express those externally in a way that's not like um creating chaos in the social setting um or taking it out on other people um i'm trying to think of the qualities that i generally because i, I want to say maturity but i'm trying to think of the qualities of what exactly that looks like that's one of them um a sense of uh being dedicated to personal growth and specifically like not just playing games with it so to speak uh, which i'm sometimes guilty of like where 
just jumping around in personal growth methods and ideas instead of actually doing the work. But um, when I see someone who's genuinely doing the work of growth, that is incredibly compelling and fascinating. So yeah, that tends to be the case. And then any way in which they are like standing out from the social scene by uh, manifesting themselves in a way that doesn't quite blend with the social scene, but you can tell when they're doing it because they're in touch with who they are and they just uh, are dedicated to like living that out as opposed to when they're doing it because they're experiencing insecurity and wanting to be different or find an identity or find a, a way of being special. And you can, it, I can't explain like, what it looks like exactly in the difference, but I can definitely feel and have confirmed when I've talked to the person about it later, like what is it that's leading them to be different from the social scene around them? Absolutely. And so Emerus likes people who have successfully individuated in terms of young. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because I'm not fully individuated yet. And I'm like, oh yes, you are close to what I wish to move towards. And I find you fascinating and intriguing and beautiful. Yeah, we're attracted to the people who we either want to be more of or we admire in some way. And we don't want to be around people who have traits that we don't want to have, mm -hmm. even if we do have them. And so what is one superpower you would want imbued with for a day? No absorb someone else's <laughs> I never understood the absorb someone else's power. It's like they immediately assume the entire world has superpowers. It's like, if you're the only one, then your power is useless. But um, for a day is the hard part. I'm trying to think of what would be... See, the, okay, so if I was um, like, if it was a long-term thing, which I think is more revealing of like my personality it would be probably some kind of astral projection thing where you're able to like explore all of reality and like remotely travel there without having to physically travel there because then you could even do that for like other planets and star systems and stuff um, or other dimensions or something like i have a very strong that's the desire to like experience beauty um if it was just for a day, I would probably be, actually, I would probably want um, some kind of power that would enable me to cause myself and other people to immediately experience the minds of other people, like basically link people's minds. Um, but that's the, <laughs> like, cult leader in me who's like you know what if i could just like make everybody experience everyone else's emotions for like 10 minutes the whole world would probably end up more united but it's in violation of their choice and it would probably actually lead to more chaos and stuff so yeah maybe matter creation and i'll just uh see even all this is difficult because even when i'm like oh i'll just like create enough money to deal with to like deal with the poverty in the world and with um, any concern about provision in my own life and the lives of my loved ones. But even then that like one probably wouldn't work and two that's directly contrary to the attitude that I think actually produces abundance, which is not seeing, um, not thinking in terms of we don't have enough, we don't have enough and thinking in terms of like, we do have enough and we will have enough and we can trust that. Wow, that's great. And so you just want superpowers to push your NF agenda. We get it. <laughs> yes. Sorry, guys. I would just turn into a supervillain. <laughs> you come across as a remarkably fluid speaker. You are very articulate, Emerus. Is there any particular life path that excites you? Other than <laughs> um, being an online, well, I say. I want to say teacher, but really offering perspectives on life and uh, organizing a lot of the complex information out there about like spirituality and personal growth and reality and different um, spiritual and personal growth practices, like organizing that and presenting it in a way that's more easily understood because 
much of my personal growth journey has had to do with sorting through a lot of that information and intellectual stuff. And I've noticed that it, even though that's one of my like innate talents, it's been really challenging for me to find like very easy and quick summaries of that stuff. And in ways that I understand and that I'm, I'm very drawn to express ideas about those things. So that appeals to me, but then that would be like half of the um, full life that appeals to me, which is having enough, like the other half would be um, essentially some form of counseling, uh, especially for people who are very much wanting to grow personally. Um, And even if that was like just providing them with a listening ear, I would be content with that, even if I couldn't like give them all the answers to fix their problems. Cause I'm not quite sure that's how like uh, growth works. Like you usually have to sort through and figure out the answers for yourself rather than having someone tell you how to get better. But um, although you can have guides, uh, I would prefer to do both of those in an online context or at least in a mobile context, because I, also have a very strong desire to like um, move around the country or the planet and um, whether it's to be with people I've grown close to who, who I haven't um, who I don't live in the same place as, or to go to people who need a physical presence in one way or another, um, or to just see different beautiful aspects of the world. Uh, So yeah, that would be my, ideal life path online teaching and online counseling about spiritual and personal growth matters <laughs> that's beautiful so what is the most out of character thing you did Ooh. um oh man that's really hard because most of the things i've done that i'm like Ooh, that wasn't really what who i want to be or i regret that a little bit i like in examining them i'm like no that's in character it's just a part of my character i haven't dealt with and like gotten healing for just popped out um out of character is hard retreated from the world probably it's hard to say that that's out of character because it's happened um like multiple times but Usually it's when I'm completely disconnected with who I am and um, with who I want to be and just not desiring to like engage with life in general. Um, And so it's like a complete retreat from my character and from everything else if possible. And kind of a a, um, blunting of all of those sensations with distraction. Mm. Yeah, you go into NITI, <laughs> intellectualizing. Denzel says, question, I love this man. <laughs> I love you too, Denzel. <laughs> Very dearly. Dave asks, how much does the hurt's desire factor into your decision making? I won't usually push my desire on the herds. But if the herd's desire isn't um, in alignment with my desire, uh, I won't spend a whole lot more time like chilling with that herd. Uh, there is a part of me that gets angry or a- antagonistic to the herd's desire, but that's usually in the abstract. Like when I see people who have like a political or religious philosophy that's leading them to like play us versus them games then i'm like this is terrible but then i'm like like when it actually comes to the people i don't tend to bring that same anger it's kind of more anger at the philosophy um but yeah i I tend to the hurts desire factors very strongly uh, in the sense that i won't fight it but it factors very weakly in the sense that i won't uh won't go along with it, it or won't keep playing the herd if they're not in line with me I hard relate to that. So what are a few things that motivate you in life? Friends, beauty. um, The 
that pain at seeing other people's pain, um, the incredibly intriguing and compelling intellectual ideas about reality. So that's one of the reasons that I've um, spent so much time in like trying to learn about personal growth and spirituality because that same TI desire of like mapping all of reality is still there. And when I come, I've just learned in part that uh, you kind of have to, when you're building your map of reality, you kind of have to pay more attention to what um, clicks with you in your heart, as opposed to like, Oh, I have like all the perfect logical reasons for believing this. Um, and when something does click that way, or when it reveal what it, and I here, you know, how it's like a web of interrelated ideas when something like fits into a slot and I can see how that affects everything else or how it fits into the whole puzzle or like how it beautifies or it enhances everything else that really motivates me. So that's kind of my motivation for learning. Um, and then there's that, that resting in beauty thing. Um, it feels like that is what I'm trying to create and build or what I'm longing for. Um, so the, when I experience moments of um, feeling like I'm there or like, and usually it's not that I like created that moment. Usually it arose without my realization or attempt. Um, it reminds me that that reality is real. It reminds me that that state of consciousness is something that's possible. Mm. There's a concept that's really near and dear to my heart and it's mm -hmm. a beauty filter. It's almost like looking for ways to view life more beautifully is a purpose in itself too. Mm -hmm. It's almost like by finding the underlying meaning behind all everything, it's able to give you a sense that everything is beautiful and you just anticipate to see beauty where you look. And there's quite a psychological phenomenon to it too, because your mind finds the things that it looks for. So the more accustomed you are to viewing beauty, the more lucky you are in spotting it in the world too. And so it's making you more lucky in a certain way too, by mm -hmm. respecting <laughs> everything around you. Mm -hmm. And I really respect that about you, Amaris. And so how much social interaction is too much for you as an extrovert before you have to recharge? Interesting. It one, it depends on the social interaction. So if it's social interaction, that's like those 3 a.m. conversations where we're delving into deep questions about life and about ourselves and each other, uh, that I can... I don't know that I've ever reached the limit on that. Maybe that's just physical exhaustion. I, that's probably the only limit I can think of. It's like when I'm like, okay, I'm not capable of keeping my eyes open anymore. Then I do that, but I'm not socially exhausted by it. Um, and I don't think I've ever been in an environment where that's been so constant that I haven't had time to then process that stuff on my own. Cause it's usually like, you know, you're not usually staying up till 3 a.m. having those conversations night after night after night after night. Um, when, NF, go ahead. when NFs have bedtimes, they never sleep. I mean, like when they have sleepovers, it's not really sleeping much. It's just talking about <laughs> abstract concepts until one of you guys tell each other to shut up so you can actually nap before the sun comes up. <laughs> Look, if I could just sleep from the hours of like maybe 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., I would be golden. I would love that. <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, yeah. The, the other kind of social interaction though, if it's just like general social interaction, that's not focused on those more deep things. Um, I don't think like, I don't know if it's the same kind of recharging, but after a few hours of that, I'll usually feel like it's like, I'm only manifesting one aspect of myself and I'm feeling not um, fulfilled and energized by it. So after that time, I'll just be like, I'm just tired of playing this little social game. Like it, it's fun, but it's exhausting after a while. Um, Cause it's just kind of, it's kind of like, uh, if you were, it's like the difference between like going out and dancing randomly at a club um versus like 
spending the entire after <laughs> i don't really do that i don't know why i keep using that as an analogy but it kind of matches the vibe of like how i approach social situations when they're not deep um versus like spending the whole afternoon learning intricate ballroom dancing or like doing that with someone more accurately because the learning is often much more challenging but um you would get tired of just randomly dancing i think a lot faster than you would if you had a a flowing harmonious structure to the dance. That is beautiful. A kinning good conversation to an elegant dance. Well, it's almost like there's chemistry when there's a dance between two people too. So it's this building of this once in a lifetime type of moment where you kind your mind kind of dances with another mind and you exchange universes for a split moment mm -hmm. and it's like oh this is how you see the world oh that is how you see the world and for a moment in life you don't feel alone because someone has visited your perspective and mm -hmm. so you feel seen heard and valued and it's almost understood on an animalistic level too because with dancing mm -hmm. there's an animalistic connection too but it's mm -hmm. also not just primitive it's deep it's this yeah core connection feeling there's a there's a word called tantric connection and mm -hmm. i think it's like that state of connection where you have no clothes on and i think mm -hmm. nfs are always looking for to generate that in conversation and yeah. that's kind of yeah. akin to intricate ballroom dancing yes <laughs> <laughs> with no clothes on apparently <laughs> <laughs> but yeah actually um i like the analogy because Tantric practices, as far as I can tell, are usually an attempt to get into the presence of divinity or transcendentness or the universe itself, the completely in the present moment. And whatever activity is used to do so, like, yeah, that's where I think the beauty of reality and the authenticity of yourself and the growth that you want to happen and the wisdom you're looking for, like, all of that and the joy is like found there. So, yeah, I. Definitely agree with that. Yeah, because what is the opposite of feeling like you just have to present one side of you to people? It's being in the state where you can present all sides of yourself and have them exist with another person. You don't have to really hold back. Holding back is why people who are extroverts feel like they're introverts, because no one likes holding back. You'll have Oprah going like, guess what, everyone? I'm an introvert. And I have an <laughs> extroverted voice, and I'm like, Oprah, you're not an introvert. You're like the most staple Effie Dom that anyone <laughs> ever referred to. And she's certain she's an introvert. And that just goes to show that the world kind of calls for people to have superficial level of interaction. And most people don't like that, even if they're extroverts. Mm -hmm. And so just everyone thinks they're an introvert. Well, that's an exaggeration, but there are a lot of people who think they're introverts when they're not actually. Okay, I won't judge you for using hyperbole. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good with percentages or talking. Mm. <laughs> that. Well, everything is infinite, Joyce, so you don't need to bother about percentages. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's something beautiful to wanting to see the divine in another person because you're looking for these beautiful qualities within a person that give you a snapshot in, into what the divine is or could be, because you're seeing a glimpse of beauty and it's like the divine is just beauty. So you're getting a look into something that's infinite when you see something beautiful about another person. It almost scars you with beauty. It's almost like one of the ways to get freed from past trauma is also to be scarred by the beautifulness of the world because what i mean by that is it leaves a permanent impression on you it's so beautiful that you use it as a way to navigate your life mm -hmm. so i yeah. i oftentimes look for a certain beauty that is so beautiful that it can model a way to live life a state of mm -hmm. elevation an emotional response of elevation almost akin to kind of seeing a superhero but in real life but in a mm -hmm. sense they have these superpowers or these beautiful qualities of of a person that set the stage of what it should be to be human mm -hmm. and so that's wonderful yeah, and so absolutely. thank you thank you emerus for coming out and teaching the audience what it means to rest in beauty and peace and centeredness. And you're part spiritual teacher and part emerus. 
your philosophies ooze out in every part of your life. As the audience members noted, there is a picture of spiritual hugging behind you, which is so NF, yeah. so gosh darn NF. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of the few people I actually think can understand who I am. Uh, when we have our talks, I actually feel intellectually stimulated, which mm -hmm. is rare, and I'm desperate for it. And so oftentimes Likewise. I feel like a, a desert and you feel like an oasis where I'm able to refill my water bottles and it won't poison me. Because all, <laughs> like, all my life, I, I hack down cactuses, trying to get like the leftover water within cactuses while trying not to needle myself with the like, plant. But when I talk to you, it's like I actually find a resort or a place where I can refill water without fearing the needles of cacti because well, you're a safe space to feel rejuvenated and spiritual insight and you make room for people who think differently than you because you're looking to learn you're not looking to impose your worldview on other people ultimately you ultimately you see yourself as someone who is here to serve and find the best way to do that and i admire that about you because through service, we change people's lives. And through that, we cre create a ripple of people who want to change lives. So you are the beginning of the ripple effect of people who want to make a difference. So I appreciate that about you, Emerus. Thank you. I'm honored that those things have been flowing through me and um, delighted and deeply encouraged, both by the questions that we've got. Like this has also helped me gain a lot of clarity and, uh, by your encouragement, just incredibly uh, rejuvenating in the same kind of way. Thank you so much. Yay, this is really fun. We have a lot of similarities in certain ways too. Sometimes I think ENFJs are very similar in soul to, to me. So I feel less alone in the world having met a kindred soul almost. <laughs> I'm really happy. Cool. And so thank you everyone for asking really great questions. I'll see you all yeah. in the next episode. Bye.